So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Boutros, Currency Analyst with DailyFX. Uh, it's been a long day at the Expo, this is the last course, so thanks for bearing with me. Uh, this specific course will be a little bit more on, on the easygoing access. We're not going to go into all the technical indicators and uh, things that you, you should do. Uh, we're going to focus on things you should not do. And um, that's really going to make a larger difference with regards to your P&L on the downside. So we'll go over some basic things, that uh, some basic mistakes that we should avoid. And then we go into a lot more detail on on day-to-day -day trades and the things that we should really uh, keep an eye out, make sure that we're monitoring our own trade and our own behaviors. So before we get into it, I'm sure you guys have been here all day, you've seen this before. Uh, FX carries a lot of, of risk. It's a highly leveraged market, double-edged sword. Um, it can hurt you just as much as it can help you. So make sure that before you jump into any positions that it's in line with your personal risk tolerance uh, and that you have a good strategy in mind. So uh, this is... Not so much going to apply to this one because, again, we're really not going to be talking strategy. We're going to be talking more of uh, behaviors to avoid. So a quick run through what we're going to look at. Um, mistakes that people often make is that they'll jump into a market without proper strategy. And what does that even mean, having proper strategy? Um, first of all, having your limits and stops in place. Basic things like that. But also, having justification in the trade that you're putting in. Are you chasing a move because all of a sudden you saw a big run up in the Aussie and there was some news that came out? and you want to chase that move, are you, is your move justified or is your position justified? Secondly, we're going to look at identifying what trading style suits you best, which is probably, oddly enough, actually one of the hardest things. People hear of scalping, oh, I'm interested in scalping, I'll do it. Well, it's great if you can, if, that's your trading, if that suits your style, but there are some people who are much more long-term who will get into a trade and hold a position for maybe a month or a week or even years sometimes. So identifying what strategy works best for, for your personality. And we'll go over an easy way to do that. It's called a pillow test. It's pretty basic. It's pretty funny, actually. So we'll go over that. Um, and keeping your eye on the big picture. Are you over, always keeping in mind the overall encompassing trend? Whether you're short-term, long-term, medium-term, what's the overlong underlying trend? Okay? You can gauge this based on fundamentals, on technicals, on longer-term charts. Uh, but we'll take a look at that as well. And using proper risk management which you'll hear again time and time again in the strategies in this expo. It's something we really try to ingrain in your minds is that risk management is just as important as having a proper strategy. Okay? Uh, and we're going to talk about sticking to your strategy, not letting your emotions get out of the way. So, moving right along. Again, having a strategy is sort of like a business plan. So how do I know what strategy suits me best? Well, if we just take a basic model here, uh, of, your, uh, of a business plan for any, any investment opportunity that you're looking at. Uh, we, we have an idea, we try to implement the idea, we see if it works. If it works, you're in the money, right? If it doesn't, you gotta go back to the drawing board and reassess your plan. And this is really something that's pretty basic and pretty intuitive when, when we say it out loud and think about it, but it's something we don't do. It's something I had a lot of trouble with too. I have a set strategy, yet I keep taking these losses, instead of trying to go back and see, well, maybe my strategy's wrong, I try to justify it. Oh, well, there was news that came out or, or, or you know, there, something came out that must have, have, have warped the market. I can't be wrong, right? That's the type of behavior you want to try to avoid. Um, so know whether you're a long-term or short-term trader. And again, this is something very simple that uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Joel Kruger, speaks about in his strategy sessions, if you guys have seen that on Daily FX. It's called the pillow test. And basically what he says is a very simple premise. If you can put on a position and go to bed at night and have a good night's sleep, then you're trading the proper size. If you put on a position and you can't even lie down because the screen, you gotta go, you gotta go watch that trade at all times, you're trading either too much or you're risking too much. What I mean is, is either your trade size is too large or your stop losses are too far and you know that the risk is something you don't wanna take. So a very simple concept. Seems kind of silly, but it, it, really, it really works. If you can put on a trade and be comfortable with it and walk away from the computer, you're trading the right, uh, the right amount and the right style. And finally, is know whether you're a fundamental or technical trader. How many people in here know that they love technicals? They love looking at charts, different indicators. How many people here do fundamentals? Not many. And that's usually the case. Uh, most traders tend to find themselves more on the technical side. Um, but know, know which works best for you. There are traders, if you, if you follow my colleague David Song, who specifically um, specialize in trading the news. So news events, we see large volatility, right? We see huge swings, non-farm payrolls. I'm sure all of you have heard that before. We see massive swings, and he specializes in trading just those times, right? Whereas there's people like me where I'm scalping, 
although I love volatility and we need volatility for scalping to work, we don't want to trade those types of scalping because those are, are, are times of heightened emotion when we'll see massive swings. And if we're working with a scalp looking for 20 or 30 pips, we could just continually get stopped out. It gets very frustrating. So know what, what works for you. Long-term, short-term, technical, fundamental. Easy enough, right? <clears throat> so if we're talking about a specific type of trading strategy, so you know that you're a technical trader, you know that you're a medium-term trader, what type of scout, what kind of markets, conditions are you looking for? Are you looking for range trading, which is usually finding some basic support and resistance levels, whether it's in a formation, uh, a channel formation, wedge formation, head and shoulders, whatever, whatever it is that, that you see, and you're looking to play a range continually. There's something called scalping, again, which is my speciality, which I do at Daily FX. And I'm looking for much more shorter term uh, gains, 20, 25 pips, um, have all my levels laid out. That just works better for me. At the end of the day, when I leave the office, my book is closed. I have no exposure. There's some people who are event risk, again, which is what, what, what David Song does. And this is just actually um, an example of the type of volatility we can see. This is dollar yen when we saw the, the Bank of Japan intervene, right? Um, massive swings, right? On this one trade, you can do that as much as I can do in scalping in a week. But again, high risk. So know what, what strategy works best for you. And there's also uh, fundamental, excuse me, and, and the trend, fundamental and technical analysis with regards to the trend. So you're looking to play a much more extended uh, move. We're not really looking for formations per se, but we're looking for crucial levels that we're looking to play for long term. So Euro dollar, 136.50 is something I've been looking at for a while. Even though I'm not a trend trader, there are people who've been waiting for that since 145. Right, so this huge, huge, almost over a thousand pip move. Right, so know which, which works for you. No one can help you with this. No one at this expo can help you identify this information. That's the one thing that you need to take on to yourself. You need to identify what kind of trading strategy works best. And I know it seems kind of redundant, but I can't, I can't stress that enough. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at mistakes that short-term traders make, and then we'll try to address some mistakes that long-term traders make. A mistake that both of them make, you can hear me say this over and over again, is that we're, we're very quick to pull out winners, and we're very slow to shut down losers. And that, in, in that meaning, we're saying we're, we're refraining from exiting positions, winning positions, and losing positions. So to give you an example of what that means is sometimes if we have a trade and we have a limit in, in sight, what starts to happen once we start to get close to that limit? Well, this thing looks like it can move some more. Let, let, let me wait. Right? I could probably get, I could probably squeeze out another 15 pips here, and they won't get out of the trade. When it's clearly hit your limit, right? The same respect is on the losing side. Well, the trade's moving against us, we start to become hopeful. Well, maybe it'll come back, right? Nah, I can't be wrong. The analysis is correct. I'm gonna hold this one out, it's gonna come back. And they'll ride out a losing trade much farther out than they should. And in a couple of slides, we'll actually see that traders, this is the biggest mistake traders make, is that they hold their losing trades way far out, surpassing their gains, even though the number of profitable gains to losing gains is in their favor. And if you didn't catch that, again, we'll have a slide showing that in just a second. So being flexible with your strategy. If some of you have traded stocks, um, shorting the market, you know, people who short the market and stocks tend to be like, we look at them as the bad guys. You know, they, they're, 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 they're looking for markets to move down. But in currencies, it's just as natural. And you're actually always short something. If I'm long euro dollar, I'm long the euro, I'm short the dollar. If I'm long dollar yen, I'm long the dollar, I'm short the yen. So you have to be flexible in the fact that going long and going short is irrespective. There should be no distinguishing, distingu distinguishing difference in your mind between doing that. You should be just as comfortable going long as short. And failure to identify the long-term encompassing trend. What do I mean by that? Well, again, we're, we're focusing on, 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 on uh, mistakes short-term traders make here. Here we see a, a euro dollar chart a few years back here going back to 2002, moving up. On this specific chart, you might see a signal very nicely right here for a short, right? I see well, my indicators line up. I see some resistance there. I try to go short, but in fact, the overall encompassing trend is to the top side. So we want to make sure we want to take a step back and take a look at the bigger picture. What is the overall encompassing trend? As opposed to taking shorts against the trend, you're better off taking longs in that position. So instead of trying to jump in here to go short, use this drop as an opportunity to go with the trend, to go long. Does that make sense? 
Seems pretty intuitive, right? But again, it's something we never do. I'm looking at a 30 minute chart, I'm a short term trader, whatever, I don't need to look at daily charts. We have to keep our eye on the bigger picture. On a 30 minute chart, a buy signal might be clear as night and day. Stochastics is, is showing a buy signal, MACD is showing a buy signal, RSI is oversold, it's bouncing off resistance. All this stuff is telling me to buy, but if the overall encompassing trend is to the downside, we need to, we need to re stand back and be reserved and not jump into that position. And the basics of that is just taking a, a, long, a step back and looking at a wider time frame. So I usually look at daily charts. If I'm still not getting clear indication on a bias, I still can't tell if markets are trending up or down, I'll take a look at a weekly chart and do whatever it takes until you have, you're comfortable saying, well, this specific market seems to be trending to the top and downside. And again, it seems like, hey, that's the hardest thing in trading, right? It's a 50-50 shot. But when we're talking about uh, the profitability or profitability over time, you're going to always, shouldn't say always, but you will, you, you will tend to do better if you trade with the trend. And you probably heard this, the trend is your friend a million times. Pretty corny statement, but it's true. So more mistakes short-term traders make is something I like to call indicator overload. Does this, if this chart looks like something you have at home or something that you're looking at, you're probably using too many indicators. And I was the biggest culprit with this starting out in the market. Uh, I fell in love with stochastics. I fell in love with RSI. I was, oh, MACD with the histogram. That's great. Fibonacci retracements, moving averages. Hell yeah, throw them on, right? But you tend to get to a point where you're being clouded and you're looking more at indicators than the actual price action. And nothing supersedes price action, right? That's what we're trading off of. So find indicators that you're comfortable with. I encourage you to, to try, test out different indicators, but don't overload. Personally, I like to use uh, uh, RSI. I like to use three moving averages, a 20, 50, and a, and a 100 on, on a 30 minute chart. Um, and that's it. And I'll draw my Fibonacci extensions and that's it. There are people who, who swear by, by, by RSI, you know, or, or, or stochastics. You know, stochastics is the greatest thing. I go to stochastics church every Sunday, stochastics is my thing. But, again, They'll throw on four other different indicators, and now all of a sudden I'm getting counter, counter signals. Stochastic saying buy, but this is telling me to sell. And it's going to happen time and time again. So you want to be comfortable with one or two indicators at most, specifically with oscillators, guys. Oscillators can be very, very tricky. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of too, using too many oscillators, but for those of you who, who feel comfortable with it, don't overload. Because remember, oscillators are working off of previous price action. Nothing magical about them. They're not projecting future prices. They're just telling you what's happened. Right? So avoid indicator overload. Now, more, more short-term trader mistakes, and again, I'm going to focus a little more on short-term because that's what I do, but we'll get to some of the long-term mistakes as well, is knowing when to trade. Um, what trade is, is more, most conducive to your specific strategy? So keep your eye on the economic calendar. Know what type of prints are coming out. You know, if there's a GDP coming out or, or an employment print coming out, if you're already in a position, you want to make sure that you have that planned accordingly. Specifically, when I trade, I try to avoid these, the, these events altogether. So again, if you've been following me, I, I do the scalping reports for daily FX. On the very bottom of the report, I'll tell you, hey, here's the event risk. You know, Trade at your own risk. Here's what we're looking at. On this specific trade, most of the time, I won't have any event risk. I'll try to pick a pair that doesn't have much uh, economic data coming out. But there are other people who, who, who trade on those, like I said. So they're waiting for those announcements to come out. Second thing is also what your cost on the trade is, which is going to be your spread. So if you're a short-term trader, you're looking to make 20, 20, 25 pips on a trade, taking a spread of eight lots on a sterling yen or, or, or kiwi yen, it's probably not the best pair for you to be trading, right? Because your half your, your profit target is going to be taken in the spread. So know which pairs are best to trade, know which times are best to trade. What's the most highest time of liquidity, which is going to directly impact the spread, right? As we see more liquidity in the market, there's more, there's more buyers and sellers, we'll see that spread tighten. So typically we'll see that there's a spike in volatility at most of the opens. So the European open, which is going to be, with regards to the Eastern time here we're talking about, is going to be around 3 o'clock, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. If we're talking about the Asian open, we're talking about 7, 7, 7, 8 o'clock at night. And obviously the US open is where we see the largest amount of volatility right here, or the lar largest amount of volume. Um, so we're going to see a lot, of, a lot of market movements during those times. Does that make sense? Okay. So moving right along. 
we already talked about this, be mindful of the economic calendar. Not just what prints are coming out, but the significance of these prints. I'm not going to hold off on a scalp report because there is a, uh, I don't know, there's, a, there's an employment report coming out of Portugal. You know? Yeah, it's important for Portuguese, for the for Portuguese people, for the Portuguese market. But for the overall encompassing market, we're not going to really see too much volatility on that. Now, if we're seeing unemployment coming out of Australia, which happened last week, which is actually surprisingly negative, right? That tended to move to market a little bit more substantially. So on daily effects, on our economic calendar here, uh, it's free, it's right on the website. It tells you a quick, easy look on the, the significance of the print, whether it's high, low, or medium. Be mindful of the ones that are medium and high on the trade that you're looking to get into. Pretty easy stuff, guys. So that leads us to long-term mistakes. Well, what's the first long-term mistake? It's the same as a short-term mistake. Failing to close out trades, whether they're winners or losers. And uh, I spent a couple of years working on a trade desk, like I mentioned before, and you'd be surprised how many times you can see this in action. You know, you, you tend to, you know, all the, all the accounts are just numbers to us, and you see the trades that are coming in. You'll, see, you'll start to recognize accounts by number because you just see the same mistake being made. The trade is in the money, it's 100 pips in the money, and that same guy, I'll just watch that account, and I'll watch him take all those losses down, and he'll close at 100 pip loss. With the same respect, we'll watch people continually get into the same trade over and over again in the same direction because they're, they're stubborn that their bias is not, is not, is not wrong. They, they can't be wrong, right? We're humans, we don't like to be wrong. So exiting and, and closing, whether it's a winner or a loser, this is only gonna come with having a strategy. Before you're getting into a position, you know your loss, you know your risk on the trade, and you know where you're looking to take your profit. Secondly is never buy and sell if you're unsure of the overall trend. And this is something that, that, that for long-term traders is huge. You know, you, you're looking at a, at a four-hour chart or a daily chart, you're getting a nice, nice buy signal, but the overlong, over encompassing trend is still to the opposite direction. So I, I'm always, you'll hear me say multiple times, especially on the scalp reports, I'm only gonna take positions in my bias, right? I'm looking at much a much shorter term trade. I can see a million signals telling me to go, to, to go long, but if, I, if my bias on the pair is to the downside, I'm only taking shorts. I'm using these longs to get in better positions on shorts. So if you're lacking conviction, don't get into a position and chase it. Um, and don't get stuck in one pair, especially for long-term traders you tend to put on a trade and you know, it might take a couple of days or a week or two to get into. Um, don't lock yourself into one, one, one pair. You know, if you're fine, if you're not having much, uh, much luck or you're just not having a good performance on one pair, diversify. You know, there, there are specific pairs that'll be more volatile than others. There are specific pairs that'll trade better with longer term positions than others. And just be mindful of that. What are other mistakes long term traders make? Well, averaging into a position, does everyone know what averaging into a position means? When we average into a position, it's a trading strategy actually. We're using market fluctuations against us to get better entries. So for example, I'm short here, market goes up, I wait, I take another short here because I think that this is going to be better positioning. Now I'm two lots in. My average rate on that trade is better, is lower. I'm looking to buy. Unless you've had much experience using this, this is a huge disaster waiting to happen. Right? Because what we're doing is all we're doing is we're compounding our losses. So you're, 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 you're long from here. You didn't take that gain. You, hold, you held it. So now you're long from here. So now you're losing, one, you're losing 10 pips on a standard lot, per, per $10 per pip. Now you're losing $20 per pip. Now you're losing $30 per pip, $40 per pip, and all of a sudden you have a huge disaster on your hands. Because why? Because you tried to average in a trade because you're, you, you, price data is telling you something, but your mind is telling you something else. Your mind is telling you, no, this market's gonna go up, so I'm just gonna keep buying at these positions because I'm just gonna have a better average rate. When in fact, you could be wrong. It's the hardest thing for us to accept, and all you're doing is making a bad situation worse. Massive mistake. One of the biggest mistakes new traders make Highly advise against doing it. Um, don't get me wrong, there are, are traders who base their career on averaging into positions. They're much more longer term. But these guys can stand and take a position being three, 400 pips against them. You know, they have that luxury. They can be in four, five, six standard lots and have huge, huge losses. And then when the market finally does return, if we're waiting for a bounce back, they will be well positioned. But for the average retail trader, it's a recipe for disaster. So, moving along. Picking tops and bottoms, similar to averaging in, right? We think that this is a bottom, 
We're looking at RSI. RSI looks over, oversold here, so this must be a bottom. I'm going to buy here. I'm going to wait for this top move. Well, it didn't work. All right, well, luckily I had to stop below. I had, I had to stop 15 pips away. Well, look, this looks like the bottom here. I'm going to try to go in long here. RSI looks oversold. Didn't work. RSI looks oversold here. Again, this is late March. This is a, uh, an Aussie EuroCAD chart. Actually, this was one of the scalp reports. Again, RSI looks short here, late April. RSI is way oversold. Go long. Didn't work. Try to avoid trying to justify price action by paying too much attention to market, market rhetoric, um, talking heads on TV. You know, you can watch CNBC, and every day you'll watch CNBC. They do a great job of reporting the news, but there's always going to be someone saying, hey, this is a bull market. Buy. It's great. There's always going to be someone saying, wow, we're in for a recession, guys. Watch out. So do your own analysis. Yeah, you might want to read in, look into it, see what the market expectations are, see what kind of ideas are coming out, but don't let that affect your own analysis. At the end of the day, you're the one trading the account. At the end of the day, it's your profit and loss. So be neutral. Take it for what it's worth. Take it with a grain of salt. Sticking with your strategy. I mean, this, I feel like we're beating this to death, but this is something that, again, goes over and encompasses everything we've spoken about so far. Um, watching price action that can sway your bias and, and cause an impulsive trade. So I've done this. I'm, I'm very guilty of doing this myself. I get into a position, all of a sudden there's a huge spike to the opposite side, whether it's the upside, downside, then I start to think to myself, wow, you know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is not such a good idea, and I pull out. Even though I have my stop and my limit in place, I'll pull out because intraday action or, 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 or intraminute action is giving me a, a bias on the wrong side. So a good way to do this, guys, is to get into your position, put your stops and limits, and walk away. Walk away. If the market's correct and your analysis is on point, you're going to take that limit, you're going to come back, you're going to be up. If the market goes against you and your analysis is wrong, you're going to go down. But you know what? When we go, when the, if, if the market does go against us and we lose on that trade, we have more conviction. Well, my parameters were in line. The indicators I was looking at was giving me this trade to go short. What went wrong? Was it because I didn't check out the economic calendar and a release came out that caused a spike? Was it because there was a central bank announcement that I didn't know about that, that came out and said we're going to hold interest rates until 2013? Absurd concept. And don't chase moves along the same, along the same, along the same, same, same means, same thought process. So if we see that uh, there is an impulsive move, and sometimes this happens a lot with people who are trading the news. You know, sometimes when we get an initial news release, market data is not clear. Market direction is not clear yet, right? If you were with us for the FOMC announcement a couple weeks ago, it took an hour from when the FOMC came out and gave their statement for markets to actually digest the data and choose a direction. So don't chase a trade. Don't, don't, don't chase an, ex, an extended move, because extended moves or spikes, all they're, all they're showing you is, is a heightened emotion, heightened impulse in the market. And trying to chase those moves usually will, 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 will be pretty detrimental, because we usually see a really fa fast pullback, right? If, we, if there's an economic announcement and a break happens, we see a 50 pip strike to the top a lot of times. More often than not, we'll see that retrace right away. So chasing moves, dangerous thing to do. Secondly is compromising your entry and exit points because you're panicking. And again, closing a position because of you're losing patience. Well, it looks like this level, I'm looking to get out here. That's where my stop is, but I don't know. It's just kind of wandering, it's just kind of wandering. Let me just, let me just pull it here. Well, if there's hesitation before it hits your stop, that should encourage you. Right? That means market's direction is probably in the right bias, and we're seeing just some congestion before the, the, the initial move. With the same respect, you're going to sacrifice your entry points because you've been watching the market all day. I'm looking to go short from 136.50 or one, or one uh, I'm sorry, 140.50, uh, which is the, the, the level I was, we we're looking for on the break on the euro, if you've been following me for quite some time. I've been waiting for this break for so long, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to get in here. Bad idea. Be neutral. You guys are, gonna, are learning this for a reason. You have your, your, your own set of analysis, your own set of rules that you're going to trade by. Stick by them. So proper money management. And this is the, the, the nitty gritty of, of really the largest mistakes that traders make. So here's what I was talking about earlier. If we look at this chart, we see all the currency pairs here, most of the currency pairs that we carry. And we'll see that on a pure winners to losers basis, traders are actually more often correct than they are not. 
And we're just talking about gains to losses. Nothing to do with size of the gain, nothing to do with size of the loss. We're just talking about winners to losers. On most of the pairs, with the exception of the poor Aussie yen there, traders are actually doing pretty well as far as choosing market direction. But a deeper look shows that actually their losses far outweigh their gains. Sometimes as much as three to one. So what does that tell us? Well, you might be picking the right direction more often than not, but guess what? Your losers are so much bigger, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. I could be right on six trades for a 20 pip gain on each trade, and I'll take one loss of, of 160, 80, 180 pips. It's gonna undo everything I just worked on. The massive mistake that, I, that happens over and over and over again, especially with short-term traders who are looking to scalp Take a 20 pip gain here, 20 pip gain here, 20 pip gain here. Oh, this went against me. I'm going to take a 100 pip loss on this one. You just undid the whole week. So, again, simple concept. Happens more often than not. Identify things to avoid. Using stops and limits is something that's subjective. Stops should not be an option, right? If you don't know your exposure on the trade, there's no way you're going to pass the pillow test we were talking about earlier, right? There's no way. Because you're just in there, that thing could move against you 100 pips, there's no way. Stops are a necessity. And uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to, to put your stops in. Limits are greatly encouraged. I personally don't like to use limits when I'm scalping because sometimes if I see a break of a major level or reaches my specific target and there's a lot more conviction, I might hold that to the next level that I'm looking to trade. But stops aren't an option, guys. If you're trading without stops, you're, you're really taking on way too much risk. So never trade with a risk reward ratio of one to one and never risk more than 5% of your equity. This 5% of your equity, again, you know, some people will trade with 2%, so if they have X amount of dollars, they won't risk more than 2% per trade. Some people trade uh, you know, even lower on larger accounts. I've seen people only risk more than 1% of their, tra of their total equity in the account. Um, but usually 5% is, is, is really the threshold you want to do. A 5% down day is a pretty bad day, right? We pretty, pretty much all agree on that. So don't overexpose yourself to risk. And a risk reward ratio of one to one, well, that's very easy. If I, if I flip a coin and I tell you, hey, if, if you win this coin toss, you're going to get 100 bucks. I'm going to pay you 100. But if I win, you're going to pay me 200. You're going to take that bet? Makes no sense. Again, something so basic, so intuitive that we tend to oversee. We jump into a trade impulsively. Well, I have my limit in set in mind. I have my limit. I'm looking forward to tag that. Well, where's your downside? Because if your downside's smaller than that gain, even if you're certain I'm going to make that 10 pip gain, if you don't have a downside limit or you don't have your stop in place, it doesn't matter doesn't matter. So again, your risk tolerance pill test, really good way just to gauge whether you're trading the proper amount, uh, account size. So going deeper even into that is moving your stops and limits. And I've, I've again, something early on in my career, something I've done a lot of times, is you have your stop, you have your limit, market starts creeping up towards that stop, things start to look a little shaky. Well, let me maybe just push it back a little, 10, 10 more pips. Just give it some more room, just so it doesn't tag my stop. Same respect, market's going down, or, or, or I'm sure market's going down, it's heading to my limit. This thing looks like it goes some further. I'm just gonna push that limit a little bit lower. Let me see if I can grab uh, maybe 10, 15 more pips. Big mistake. Trust me, big mistake. <laughs> I've done it so many times. So we want to remain neutral. You, you put your stop there and your limit there for a reason. Trust your, trust your analysis. If you can't trust your analysis, then you're, you're not, you should not be trading live cash yet. Um, don't close your trades without good reason. Same thing. Same thing. Well, again, it hasn't hit my limit, but now I'm starting to get scared. Now I'm starting to get scared because I think this might, I think this might reverse on me and I want to lock in these gains. I have a winner. Let me just take the winner right now. Bad idea because that will screw your risk to reward ratio, right? Because if you're working with one to one and you took less than you're willing to risk on this next trade, on this first trade, well, your next trade, your risk to reward is still one to one, but your loss is going to be bigger now, right? So be, be, try to be neutral. And it's such an easy thing for me to tell you guys, try to be neutral. I understand how, how tough it is, but it's something that you're going to have to be disciplined with. And it's really one of the keys of being able to, to, to implement a strategy effectively. So an easy way to just overall encompass everything we covered today, 
is to make a quick list of, of things we want to avoid doing. So have a concrete game plan and stick with it. We don't want to shift around our stops and shift around our limits, adjust our risk to reward ratio, start moving around. Put your strategy at play and watch it. If it doesn't work out, guys, it's very simple for us to go back and take a step back and be much more objective now and see why that went against us. Secondly, we want to identify our stops and targets before jumping into the position. So you might have a whole series of, of processes to find out what the bias is. I'm getting some indicators here telling me to sell. I see stochastics giving me a downside cross. I'm jumping into the position. OK, great. So you have a game plan. Put your stops and limits in. Have those in sight before you even jump into the trade. Use proper risk management. Again, risk to reward. Minimum should be one to one. Minimum. Again, I'm scalper, so I use one to one on all my trades. But for, for, for most uh, trend traders and, and, and traders that are range bound trading, usually want to keep it at least maybe two to one, three to one is more, is more, more of pro probably say the standard. So you're looking to make uh, three times more than the amount that you're looking to risk. Avoid indicator overload, like that chart we saw. So if you can't see the bar because there's too many, too many indicators on, on the chart, then you're probably using too many, too many indicators. So indicator overload, very common, very common mistake. Uh, know what the best times are to trade. Watch the calendar. Know what times you're going to see an imp uh, a pickup in liquidity. Guys, there's something called the opening range, which I covered in a couple other uh, courses today. Basically, the opening range is a good way to gauge what kind of uh, volatility we should see in the market. So for an intraday trader, that first hour of trade, if you're trading dollar-based pairs in the US market, that's really going to be a, a good indication of what we're going to see for the, rest of, for the rest of the day. And actually, if we make, that initial, uh, when we make that initial range in the first hour of trade, if we see a top side break of that break, of that range rather, you're usually going to see an extended move higher. If the opening range is, is X and we see a bottom side break of that, well, we're usually going to see the market continue to trend lower. And you can use this on all different uh, time frames. So if we're talking about um, a monthly trade, the first week in the month is often a good gauge of what that opening range is going to hold for the entire month. If we're talking about even farther, there's an actual trade strategy based on something called the January effect, where people will just take that January range, and if we see a top side break, they're long. If we see a bottom side break, they're short. So again, I'm not telling you that that's a strategy to trade, but keep in mind, a concept of opening range is really going to help you figure out what, you know, what's the best time for you to trade. So usually if I'm trading dollar-based pairs, I'm actually flat in the first hour of trade in the US Open, just because I want to gauge and see what kind of market volatility, what kind of range we're going to put in in that first hour, and then I can go ahead and jump into my positions. Be flexible. Be flexible. Be able to identify when you're wrong. Again. If we get into a position and it moves against us, let the stop trigger. Don't pull it out. You never know. It could come back. But if it doesn't, why were you wrong? Right? Be flexible. If, the, if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to short a, a, short a currency, guys, and it keeps moving up, there's, there's going to be a temptation to, well, you know, it already moved up 100 pips. I got stopped out three times. It's got to come down from here. Right? Be flexible. If the market's giving you a signal that's clear conviction in one direction, go with it. Number seven. Never take on position without proper conviction. This pretty much goes along with, ch with chasing, is what we talked about before. So let's not try to jump after moves, uh, after an extended move, whether it's an economic announcement, a trend breakout. If we see that channel formation starts to break. If you didn't catch initial move or you're not in it early, don't chase it. Because the, 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 the probability that we're going to see a pullback in that is pretty high. Um, number eight, use stops. Number nine, use stops. Number 10, use stops. I can't stress it enough. I can't stress it enough in any trading, any trading strategy you use. There was one guy, I remember back, uh, back when I was on the trade desk, that used to trade his account using his margin as a stop loss. So he would get into a position heavy, heavy, heavy leverage. Heavy leverage. We're talking you know, risking multiple lots on, on a smaller trade. And he would wait. He wouldn't even put a stop. He'd have a limit in there, but he'd just wait. If the market stops him out, if we get margin called, right? He'll be out of the position. And maybe there's some merit to that type of strategy, but for the most of us, it's not a good idea. If you're getting margin called, then you're probably either trading way too much or you're risking way too much. And one thing that we, we want to we always consider, and again, I, I talked about this earlier today on, on another presentation, is that when we're looking at trade size or the amount that we should be trading, that could, that's pretty paramount, right? 
And the way we should be calculating that is if I have a 5% tolerance, I don't want to trade, I don't want to lose more than 5% on a specific position of my account equity. That figure, whether it's 500, whether it's 1,000, whether it's 50,000, that's the amount you're willing to, 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 to risk, right? You need to trade the amount of lots accordingly. So if my risk on the trade is, is 50 pips and I have a uh, stop loss 50 pips away, my 5% on this specific account, let's say I'm willing to risk 5% on a $5,000 account, it's $250. Well, $250, 50 pips, it's $2 a pip. You should be trading maximum of two mini lots, mini lots, if you're going to be taking that position. Whereas if our stop loss is much closer, say I'm only willing to risk 30 pips, well, 30 pips times $1 a pip, well, I could probably take on four or five lots on that point. Does that make sense? Okay. That's pretty much what we want to cover today. One thing, quote, I wanted to leave you on, couldn't be more truer, is when we're looking about taking risk reward and figuring out where we're looking to take profit and not, one of the most important things is sometimes it's not how large your winners are, but how small your losers are that really make the biggest difference in trades. And again, we can see strategies, and, and again, from just being, having the experience with the trade desk, we can see strategies that work out pretty well. And in fact, point in fact, if you back test those strategies, they're working out great. But their losers are so massive, it still is going to dwarf all the gains that they put in. And it's either letting a trade get away from you or not having proper risk to reward ratio on each trade. So with that, I mean, I'll take any questions, you know, uh, with regards to some of the material that we covered here. But um, thanks for coming to the expo today. Enjoy the rest of the expo.